Thank you, President Marsham. Good afternoon, Rotarians and guests. Today we are fortunate to have with us two freshman legislators representing your county in our Pennsylvania House of Representatives, which gives them an opportunity to, to introduce themselves to us and share with us some of the good, bad, and ugly in Harrisburg. My conversation earlier with Kristen was they're going to tag team their conversation with us. And I thought, you know, we hear the WWF, WWE, well, we'll call them the WIH, Wind in Harrisburg. <laughs> Let me tell you, these two ladies have received a lot of accolades in their seven and a half, eight months of service there from their peers and their legislative leaders. Yesterday, I don't know how many of you might have watched PCN or heard some of the local news. It was quite an interesting day on the Hill in somewhat uncharted waters. Um, the House attempted to override the governor's veto of the general appropriation bill. And I'm pretty sure Kristen and Kate will maybe speak a little bit to that process. Um, and we understand, according to what Chairman, Budget Chairman Bill Adolph said from Delaware County, the negotiations are still very difficult in that budget. However, there was one thing around 5 36 o'clock after I got home, I heard Speaker of the House Mike Terzai announce from his walk, Rostrum, I quote, Representative Kate Clump of Gower County moves the House adjourned for the day. That's how I spelled relief last night, knowing that these two ladies would be here with us and they wouldn't be up there on the hill. So again, I thank them for uh, sharing their time with us today. We will have questions and answers, hopefully, at the end of their talks. Let me give you a little bit of bio about each of our, our guest speakers. Kristen represents the 93rd Legislative District in Southern York County. She's a member of the Children and Youth, Education, Health, and State Government Committees and as a freshman was appointed Deputy House Majority Whip. Chris is a native of New Jersey who was born in Camden. Following her high school graduation, she attended Rutgers University where she earned a bachelor's degree in political science and a master's degree in public policy. She served on the Dallas Town School District for three years and is a former legislative staff member in the House Republican Caucus. Her tenure as a school board member gave her a unique uh, perspective on the process of funding our schools, which is a very hot topic today, and which why she lists property tax relief for her constituents as a priority. Kristen is also a proponent of improving this Pennsylvania small business climate, having realized the challenges associated with owning a small business of her own. Representative Kate Klum. She's a ninth generation Hanover area resident. Uh, she again was elected in November of this past year to serve in the 169th Legislative District. Kate's mission as a lawmaker is to ensure state government is efficient, phys physically re fiscally responsible, and places taxpayers first. Prior to her election to the State House, Kate worked in the President George Bush 43 White House as a member of the National Economic Council team as well as his communications team, where she shared time with the late Tony Snow, you might remember that name, and also a Fox uh, personality, Dana Perino. Kate has also worked at a, as an intern for Congressman, then Congressman Todd Platts. Upon graduation from Henner High School, Kate earned degrees in economics, history, and public policy studies from Dickinson College, and her Juris Doctorate from the Dickinson School of Law at Pennsylvania State University. Her committee assignments include aging and older adult services, children and youth, gaming oversight. Within the last month or two, she was appointed to the Judiciary Committee, which is quite a prestigious committee to be on. So they consider themselves sisters because they see each other more than their own family. So we're going to tag team their presentation today. We please welcome our two state legislators, Representative Clark and Representative Hill. Like to call ourselves. So thank you 
so much for having us today here at Rotary. I've attended Hanover Rotary, but this is the first time I've been here to York, and I really appreciate the warm, warm welcome. It's amazing to be up here with my sister in Harrisburg. Kristen and I share an office together, um, so we spend lots of long nights together, and I do believe we did do the bunny hop. We did. We, we had a secretary who at 24 informed me she had no idea what the money hop was. Uh, we, we, you know, by 10 o'clock at night, we were really punch happy. So he said, Kate, okay, hold on, and we can fix this. So we got Mark's wealth on YouTube, and we proceeded to teach her the money hop. I have to tell you, I'm really glad that none of our colleagues saw this with me. So um, we work really hard in Harrisburg, and in the process, we, we try and have a little fun, too. So, well, as freshman legislators, we are two. Uh, right now, 24. We originally came in with a class of 22 new freshman uh, Republican lawmakers. We're now at 24. We gained a seat with Martina White from Philadelphia. Yes, there is a Republican woman younger than I am representing a district in Philadelphia, which is absolutely amazing. Uh, and yesterday, Greg Rockman joined us. He replaced Glenn Grell, who many of you know, who represented the West Shore uh, up in Cumberland County. So we're now new freshman legislators, 24 Republican members strong. And I don't know about Kristen, but I, I really when we went door to door. I really felt that when we were going to be sent to Harrisburg, the people who we knocked on the doors really asked for some big things and asked us to take on some really big challenges that are facing the people of Pennsylvania. <coughs> Um, number one was the, the pension issue. Um, we, we heard that going door to door. Absolutely. Kristen, I'm sure you could talk a little bit more about property taxes too. She uh, she heard about property taxes uh, as, as much as I did. Absolutely. But as a school and board director, as a school board director, I have had the um, auspicious task of trying to be as fiscally responsible as possible um, and to balance the, the needs of a high quality education for the students in the Dallas Town School District uh, with the need to protect the taxpayers' pocketbooks. So clearly, property taxes are a huge issue. And the more you talk to people, the more you realize that the over-reliance on the local school property tax in New York County is a result of many, many things. Pensions, as as Kate noted, uh, is the number one issue. It is the greatest financial burden that our school districts face, along with unfunded mandates, uh, prevailing wage, and the funding formula. I'm sure that as your Countyans, you all know that about 23 years ago, they put a hold harmless provision in the school funding formula that meant that students in school districts that continued to grow received less money per pupil than school districts where their student population declined. They received more money per pupil because the amount a school district received could never be lowered. So what has happened as a result, your county has grown. Obviously, Kate Clunk's district, she will tell you, came from Philadelphia. The 169th district was in the city of Philadelphia. The city of Philadelphia has seen massive uh, population decreases. People are leaving the city for a variety of reasons. And a lot of folks are coming across the border from Maryland, um, settling down in Shrewsbury, Stewartstown, and all across our southern Maryland border. And because of that, we received a seat. The seat shifted out of Philadelphia and moved to Southern York County. So when my colleagues from the northern tier um, that are living very high on the hog when it comes to uh, school funding. 70% of their, some of those school districts receive 70% of their funding from the state. Dallas Town's 23%, New York Suburban is 17%. It was about 20, it's, it's, it's bad. And when they say, oh, well, there's no school funding crisis, well, come on down to your county. The reason that I'm here is because we're growing. And the whole harmless provision has really hurt our local school districts. And at the end of the day, combined with the pension costs, prevailing wage, your property taxes continue to go up. So that is certainly a number one priority for us up in Harrisburg, along with uh, 
Uh, we heard a lot from folks who would like to get government out of the liquor business. Um, I would imagine that we are probably looking at a lot of criminals here in this room because um, whether you're aware of it or not, if you bring alcohol over the border from Maryland, you are considered a bootlegger. We won't make you raise your hands. No. <laughs> no <laughs> And then, you know, lastly, and, and Kate has an exceptional background in this, it's making sure that our economy is growing, that we're keeping businesses in Pennsylvania, and that we're keeping jobs in Pennsylvania. Right about the time we took office, Governor Scott from Florida came and said, he wanted to take our jobs to Florida. And we said, how did that happen? And, and that's what we hosted a policy hearing. I sit on the policy committee, uh, the only freshman member on the policy committee, and we looked at Pennsylvania and the economic climate and the jobs climate. In our first hearing, I made sure that the chairman knew that we wanted to have it here in York County. And we had a hearing, we heard from our local businesses, and we heard from them, please do something about our tax system. Do something about our regulatory system. So we heard that all across the state. It wasn't just here in your county, it was all across the state. So we need to make sure, and again, we'll talk a little bit about the budget later, but keeping that in mind is we've gone through the past couple of months of what is really best for Pennsylvania in creating that good economic climate so that all of us here have strong businesses, have strong families, and, and jobs to go to when you wake up in the morning and uh, food on the table when you, when you come home at night. So, those are some of the, the big ticket items that we've been uh, hearing from our constituents about and have been working on up in Harrisburg. And I do have to say, we work very well together we, as a team, not just the two of us. The, the entire York County delegation is, is a unique entity, all of our legislators. And, and honestly, on both sides, both of, the sides aisle, of the aisle, um, York County is renowned in the legislature for working really effectively <coughs> together. Um, and Ruck can, can definitely speak to that. <coughs> the work that we've all been able to do um, to help our visitors bureau and your county. Um, it, you know, and when we talk about working collaboratively, obviously we want to get to the budget and, and um, we were really struggling last night to just sort of put yesterday's experience in context. And, and I finally said to Kate yesterday, you know, um, it's, it's almost like the opening line of Charles Dickens' novel, A Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times and it was the worst of times, if you could have consolidated that into one day. You know, um, Kate and I started the morning um, for the very first time ever. We walked into a meeting on municipal pension reform and found that since, since we have started working on this issue, from the day we arrived in Harrisburg, we were finally joined by our colleagues on the other side of the aisle. In every meeting up until that point, it was Kate, myself, Representative Grove, Mayor Bracey, the Democratic mayors and the Republican legislators. Not only was the room filled in, in a bipartisan fashion, it was standing room only. Mayor Kim Bracey was there, uh, Mayor Rick Gray joined the discussion on the problems that are facing our municipal pension funds and the possible solutions. Uh, Auditor General, Eugene Pasquale, another York County face, was, was there and he gave an overview of the governor's task force on municipal pension reform. And um, it was really exciting because the things that we had been saying for so long um, were, were being talked about, you know, transparency, accountability, fiscal responsibility, adoption of new investment and benefit standards, portability, shifting management responsibility for the unfunded pension system, um, it, you know, the viability of sales and lease of um, assets to help address the underfunding, different strategies for Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, because obviously the larger cities in the city that we have here, and, and this is hopefully going to be the launching point uh, to address the challenges that our municipalities are facing across Pennsylvania. So this was great. Oh my goodness, there were members from both sides of the aisle working together on, on one of the biggest concerns that our second and third class cities are facing. Wow, this is great. This is going to be a great day. And, and you know, I, I think, if you'll indulge me for a minute, 
we actually work on, have worked on a lot of other issues where we have all come together. Um, the, we have an initiative. You know, WellSpan and New York Hospital have done some really great things. I don't know if you're aware of it. There's a, a gentleman, Dr. Chris Echterling, who has a pilot program here that seeks to take what are known as super utilizers, people who run medical assistance, who consume huge amounts of medical resources, and they're getting their care in the emergency room because their diabetes is not being managed, their blood pressure is not being managed, and so they have medical crises. Driving those folks back into their doctor's offices so they can get appropriate medical care to manage their health conditions. And what we found is it, it saved millions of dollars to doctors. And those, and those are millions of your taxpayer dollars. And that's what we really, at the end of the day, that's been our goal, is trying to save the taxpayer dollars of this and, and working collaboratively. That Those were some of the first meetings that we had Absolutely. as new members of the state legislature, and it was Republicans and Democrats sitting around the table to try and find a solution for a very, very expensive millions of dollars just in two counties alone, in Lancaster and New York. Uh, we've had pilot programs that have shown so much promise that, that we actually brought Secretary Dallas in to talk about how do we expand these programs, how do we push these programs out to the rest of the state. Last week, in this very room, we, we sat up on a, on a podium and we talked about one of the biggest public health threats that's now facing the Commonwealth, and, and that's the epidemic of heroin and, and opioid based drug overdoses and addiction. The bipartisan hearing was held by the Center for Rural Pennsylvania, and uh, it's a legislative agency. It was part of a statewide series of meetings, and legislative action is hopefully going to soon follow once they dig through all of the data that they acquired through these hearings. And Harrisburg can work really well together. We can, and that's, that was one of the big things that we heard going forward. You, you hear it in, in Washington. The Republicans don't talk to the Democrats. Senators don't talk to members of the House. And I do have to say, in Harrisburg, um, there is a lot of collegiality across the aisle. Um, we have made friends with a lot of Democrats, um, which is, it's been welcome. When you're up there, you, you spend a lot of time on the floor yesterday, we spent over six hours on the floor. So when you're spending six hours on the floor with over 200 people, you need to make some friends um, across the aisle to just get through the day. Uh, so that's that's where we, I think, have really been um, comforted in knowing that there are people across the aisle who are willing to work with us. We're willing to work with them. Um, but it's been a, a long wrote the past couple of months as, as two new legislators. When you're up there and you want to do big things, uh, we passed an on-time balanced budget. It was very reasonable. It did not increase your taxes. And that was really important to the two of us and the rest of the delegation, and I know the Republican caucus. Because at the end of the day, folks in this room really can't afford a whole heck of a lot more to be sent to Harrisburg to be mismanaged, misspent, and more than likely sent off to Philadelphia. I, I, think, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, you know, I think uh, yesterday afternoon could probably be, if, if yesterday morning was the best of times, I, I think we could describe yesterday afternoon perhaps as, as the worst of times. And, and I think the big question that probably you all have is, is how, how exactly did we get there? Because Harrisburg can work really well together. Um, actually, uh, we had a, a very funny encounter. There are three new women on the other side of the aisle this morning. One of them has a hyphenated name. I don't know if you read any of the articles. I, I know Flint McColgan from the uh, York Daily Record is sitting up in the balcony up there. We'll say hello, Flint. And, and Flint kind of said to me, so um, what exactly are we supposed to call you? You see, I have a hyphenated and no one quite knows what to do with it. So, new woman elected from down in the southeast, and I said, hi, I'm the other woman with the hyphenated name. If I can help you in any way, please let me know. It's not an easy go of it. And she said, well, not only do they not know what to do with my name, they can't even spell them right. So, she was worse off than even I was. But we 
1930. There were some light moments yesterday. But, you know, I, I think we have to go back and, and just sort of remind everyone that on June 1st, every state house member on both sides of the aisle voted against the tax increases that would be necessary to fund the spending plan that the governor proposed on March 3rd. Every Democrat, every Republican, folks, it, it wasn't a partisan issue. There was absolutely no appetite in the House for massive tax increases, $4.7 billion of additional spending. And as my colleague from Kate Harper said, you, know, you just can't spend what you don't have. We don't have the money. We had to find it. The only way we're going to find that money is to raise your taxes. So, um, Fast forward to June 30th, um, as, as Kate referenced, we passed a balanced, no tax increase budget. We increased education spending, basic education funding, by $100 million. Um, two hours later, uh, the governor chose to veto it. So, negotiations have begun. We're over 50 days without budget at this point. Um, House leadership offered an additional $300 million for education funding, recognizing that you know, our governor feels that this is really very important. We tried to get some money to a number of human service and health-related agencies yesterday, and, and maybe Kate would like to, to talk about that, because here's, here's what you need to know. Um, The, the most fragile, most vulnerable people in our society because we cannot come to an agreement on this, because we can't get that done, um, are, are hurting. And so uh, yesterday, we, we attempted to do something, and, and that was to free up that revenue to send it out to provide those services and those programs to those individuals. <laughs> and those, uh, those, those line items, if we go back to the original budget that the governor vetoed on July 30th, in addition to, just a quick aside, in addition to vetoing the budget itself, he vetoed the fiscal code, um, which pretty much gives the instructions on how to spend the money. He also vetoed the education code which had a new education funding formula that was very fair, very equitable, and really, at the end of the day, would have helped our school districts here in York County, but he said no to that. In addition, he said no to pension reform, and he also said no to liquor privatization. But when he did the blanket overall veto, he did not exercise his line item veto power. It's one thing that our governor in Pennsylvania has as a tool that our own president of the United States does not have. So the governor could have gone through line by line and said yes and no or no to each one. And, and for the record, there are 401 lines in the budget. 274 of those lines, the legislative budget either met or exceeded the governor's request, which is approximately 68% of the budget was agreed to. So with that in mind, there were over 274 line items that we agreed on, uh, which I think is a really good starting point. And, and we really hoped that that would have been the starting point for negotiations, and we really hoped that the governor would have at least kept them in so that a lot of those human <coughs> service organizations like our rape crisis centers, our domestic violence shelters, uh, would have continued to stay in operation. Uh, about two weeks ago, I sat down and met with the president of our Hanover YMCA and the director of the Safe Home uh, for Domestic Violence Program. And they looked at me and they said, Kate, we're not going to have money to keep the doors open here in a couple weeks, probably in the next month. So if we don't pass this budget, organizations like Hanover, YWCA, and Access Door, all across the state, there are similar organizations. They're not going to have the money to be able to provide those much needed services. So when that woman calls and says, I have just been abused by my husband, I need help. There is no one at the other line unless 
the community can come together and fund these organizations on their own, even though they've already contributed thousands and thousands of dollars on their own through, um, through charitable fundraisers. So really that's where the state comes in and, and where we've been hearing this across the state, not just to me here in York, not just Kristen um, from her um, organizations, but all across the state and we said this needs to stop. We tried to correct the governor's <coughs> error in vetoing the entire budget through an attempted override veto of those line items where we agreed with the governor or provided more money. Well, I think having been a school board director, uh, one of the things that's unusual in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania is one of six states that requires the federal money that we receive from programs like IDEA, Title I, Title II, programs that provide school districts federal funds to educate students with disabilities, students that are in poverty, and provide uh, training and, and education to their teachers require legislative passage and, and signature by the governor to appropriate those funds to school districts. So right now we have a situation where federal education dollars are sitting hostage in Harrisburg, unable to be distributed because of this blanket veto. In addition, uh, school transportation funds, uh, food services, safe schools initiatives, uh, all of those things have been have been held as hostage, in addition to um, <coughs> parochial school textbooks, and, and people kind of, you know, parochial school textbooks, really? Really? Um, funding is provided for parochial schools. They have to initiate the process right after the budget is passed in June in order for them to get the textbooks for the beginning of the school year. So many of our parochial schools across the Commonwealth are um, making do without necessary resources for their classrooms. And that, that was kind of the lead into yesterday's vote. We put out how many items? It was over 20 different items. Yeah, there were um, exactly 20. 20 items. On the list here. 20 yes. items um, that we put out for an override veto vote. We have passionately asked our friends across the aisle to side with us to stand with those right, crisis centers, domestic violence shelters, school districts, food pantries. But they said no, and they, they said it was a political stunt. They claimed that it was unconstitutional, um, which I claim is, you don't know if it's unconstitutional or not because it's never been tested. And quite frankly, I would rather put up that veto override vote and question and bicker whether or not it's constitutional or not. I would rather let that let um, up to the courts and put up that vote to make sure that our local service providers have that money. Because at the end of the day, I don't think that father whose daughter was raped, who needs services, really cares at that moment what a potential legal opinion from some professor at the University of Pittsburgh really says. He wants that money to come to help his daughter. I, I think in order to pass the budget, we should not be exacting pain on people to put pressure um, to not do the right thing. Um, I did not get into to politics. I don't believe Kate got into politics to play games, particularly, particularly with the lives of the most vulnerable people in our communities. Um, I had the, the great pleasure of meeting a true statesman, Senator Hess. And I sat down with him, and I had an hour and a half with him, and I said to him, what do you remember as the most important thing that you did? Let me tell you, it wasn't a budget vote. It wasn't a passage, passage of any great piece of legislation. It was a story about a little girl that found a deer and didn't want it to be put down. And how he was able to help her have that deer turned back, to, rehabilitated and turned back into the wild. His entire career, that was the first thing he said to me. You know, so it's really important that we put people ahead of politics and that we govern instead of playing politics.
Brad and I go uh, way back. Uh, my, my dad worked with Brad when he uh, worked uh, with the Department of Revenue for a number of years up in um, Harrisburg. Actually worked under Governor Tom Wolf um, during his term as secretary. Um, so I've been able to tell Brad a, a story or two about my time at the White House. And, and everyone always asked me, what was it like to work for George W. Bush? And, um, what is it like to work at the White House? And I go back to one day when I worked at the White House that um, kind of makes you human and, and makes you realize that nothing ever goes as planned. How many of you are aware of the hardening of, of the Thanksgiving turkey? Okay. So, as a communication staffer, we sometimes assist with setting up uh, the, the events and making sure that the cameras are all there. People are in the right place. Well, that day, um, I was helping <coughs> one of my fellow staffers in the Thanksgiving turkey holiday event. And lo and behold, we had the, the turkeys out in the rose garden. They were spreading their wings, getting ready for their big turkey carving. And somebody didn't communicate with the person who was in charge of the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> and so Marty and Miss Beasley, you heard them yapping. And the yapping kept getting closer and closer and closer. And then Barney and Miss Beasley got into a little bit of an altercation with one of the Thanksgiving turkeys in the Rose Garden. Meanwhile, the president was in the Oval Office having a very important meeting, and he comes out and confronts the whole turkey flapping its wings. Barney and Miss Beasley are yapping at it. We thought maybe we were going to have a dead turkey and that the um, alternate, we always have two in case the first one cannot perform. Um, <laughs> so uh, we didn't need to use the alternate turkey that day. Um, but it goes to show that nothing ever goes as planned, even when you work at the White House. But it looked perfectly on television. No one ever knew that the, uh, the poor turkey almost died. But funny, funny little White House story, but we'll take questions here. We'd love to talk to you more about the budget or any other questions that you have about um, us personally, uh, our background, or what it's like to be up in Harrisburg um, working together. If you have a question, please stand and ask the question loudly, and would you please repeat the question before you give the answer so everyone can hear it. I have a question about the budget process and what your prognostication is about what the outcome is going to be. If you look at the financial data, it's obvious that pension reform uh, is necessary for financial stability, financial sustainability, and financial strength in Pennsylvania. So the offer was made to increase the education funding in exchange for pension reform and sector privatization. That was vetoed. It sort of set a message that, uh, that raised a lot of questions about uh, how successful we might be in getting that. How do you see this playing out? What do you think the, uh, the areas of common ground for compromise would be? And what do you think of final budget? I'm going to try and repeat that question. <laughs> um, so so uh, the question is um, prognostication on where we are going to go with pension reform and, and a final outcome on the budget. And referencing the fact that uh, when the compromise was offered by uh, House Republican leadership with the additional $300 million, it was tied to pension reform. Um, the first pension bill was vetoed. Uh, we are still waiting for word on where the governor stands on this latest offer. Um, he's had over a week. Word came to us on, yes, I guess yesterday, yesterday afternoon, uh, that the governor requested an additional 24 hours to make a decision on uh, the offer that we made. Um, and my understanding was, uh, well, when we left Harrisburg last night, we were under the impression that the governor and leadership would meet at one o'clock today. Um, now, what we have learned is that that meeting, um, the governor has, has canceled that meeting. We do not know when it has been rescheduled. So, um, prognostications? 
prognostications? Well, uh, we realized there were a couple things we didn't bring to Harrisburg with us. Um, two of those things were a crystal ball and the other was a magic wand, because there are definitely times in Harrisburg we could use both of those items. Um, <laughs> that is a million, a million dollar question. Um, now, I, I really do think that our counter offer to the governor of additional education funding and keeping pensions and labor on the table is a very good deal. Um, when, when you look, especially as a younger person in Pennsylvania, when I hear that there's over $50 billion in pension obligations that are unfunded right now, that is going to be kicked to my generation. My generation is going to be on the hook for that. We need to fix the problem now. And I, I really hope the governor understands that this is, it's not a Republican issue, it's not a Democrat issue, it is the future of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania's economy, future of, of Pennsylvania's next generation, my generation, um, of people who want to move to Pennsylvania, stay here in Pennsylvania. Uh, quite frankly, if, if I was somebody looking at where to move, I don't know if I'd move to Pennsylvania right now because of our fiscal crisis when it comes to pensions. Because at the end of the day, each and every one of us in this room is gonna be on the hook uh, to help pay for that in some way, shape, or form, unless we create some sort of reform now. So if there's the you know, TV show, let's make, you know, let's make a deal, deal or no deal, if I were advising the governor right now to really move Pennsylvania forward in a bipartisan way, I would say take the deal. Take the deal. We're offering you increases in education funding with the request of reforming our pension system that is broken and absolutely needs fixed and getting the government out of the liquor business. It's a good deal, not a deal. I, I, I agree with everything that Kate said. As the school board director, I can tell you it was $1.2 million increases year over year. If we had chosen to raise taxes in the Dallas Town School District, the increase in taxes would not have covered the increase in pension obligation. Um, there are various ways that have been discussed on how to address this. I think the one thing that is really clear is, um, you know, whether you use the analogy of it's time to cut the credit card, and we cannot continue to, to spend on a credit card that we've maxed out. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, before you start bailing water out of the ship, you gotta start plugging the holes. You can use a whole host of analogies. Um, we cannot continue down this path of incurring um, huge amounts of debt. What I can tell you from our municipal pension hearing yesterday is that the city of Pittsburgh has been incredibly responsible. Not only have they funded their pension obligation, they have paid down their debt, paid down their debt, paid down their debt, and guess what? Their debt continues to grow. Our system is not sustainable. Um, I'm a swim mom, and uh, I, I was at a swim meet at Bucknell this summer, and I thought this is really great. You know, I'm going to pair of shorts and t-shirts and sneakers, and I'm happy to just be a mom for a day. And uh, I hear from across the parking lot, if it's not my favorite representative from Pennsylvania, and I thought, oh my goodness, I can't even hide a bunk now. So it um, turns out it's a gentleman I went to high school with whose profession is selling bonds. And the first question out of his manager, I said, well, hi, Scott, how are you doing? He says, so why are you people going to fix your pension problem? And it's really good to see you, too. You know, we talk to people, we talk to people who are in the business, and they will tell you that our credit rating is not being downrated because we haven't come to an agreement on this budget. Our pension funds are directly correlated to the downgrades in our ability to, to borrow money at a reasonable rate. So we have to fix our pension problem. Pension obligation bonds, borrowing money to, to pay it down, isn't going to fix our problem. Um, so, uh, you know, as two freshman legislators, rank and file members, folks that we are telling our leadership, this needs to be done.
215 files on state practicing lawyers where the practices were created to build the office. For 12 million a year, we could buy 30 year time life insurance for these people and make it payable to the fund on their debt. I don't know what's wrong with that politically, and no one can give me a good answer to that thought. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> we should come to Rotary more often. <laughs> wow, so the, the question is that there are approximately 12 million pensioners. No, I thought it was 213. 213,000 pensioners. And could the state possibly buy life insurance so that upon their death, the state would receive a sum of money from the insurance company to pay down our pension debt. It's a new one. I haven't heard that one yet. I, I like thinking outside the box. Um, I'm processing whether we want to gamble on the future, future <laughs> on, on, on the um, eventual demise of <laughs> um, I'm not sure exactly how it will be received, but... Do you sell life insurance? What are the most positive aspects of Governor Wolf's approach to the budget? So the question is, if you did not hear, what are the most positive aspects of Governor Wolf's budget? <laughs> no, look, um, I was a school board director, clearly. I highly value public education, and I, I truly believe that we need to invest in our children's future. Now, that being said, I don't think just throwing money at education is going to improve the educational outcomes for our students. So um, I'm really happy to see the focus on education. I'd like to see uh, additional focus on um, improving education and finding money. Because uh, having been a school board director, I will tell you that there are a lot of places uh, that we have to spend money in public education, and that money doesn't make it into the classroom. So I, I would really like to see the governor um, embrace repurposing money back into the classroom. And I, I agree, I think, uh, from the education wide item perspectives of the education issues, um, funding for education certainly has stepped up and has asked for more money. We, again, gave an additional $300 million as an offer. Uh, so it's certainly a, a priority for us as well, but again, as uh, Kristen said, you really need to make sure if we are investing those additional dollars that one, some of the money's coming back here to us in North County, that's where I'll pay for it, and two, making sure that those dollars are really going into the classroom. And, and I do think that Governor Wolf wants that money to go into the classroom and go into you know, those schools that teach and make sure that our schools are actually teaching and our students are actually learning and being learners and, and really succeeding in the classroom. So I think that's one of the, the positive points of his budget. Um, but I think moving forward, um, a real positive would be if he could say yes to the deal. Thank you very much for